Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Um, so today I'm here to introduce you all to a programming language that I work on, which is OCaml. So OCaml is a functional programming language. Yeah, so uh, let me try to define what uh, OCaml really is. So OCaml is an industrial strength uh, functional programming language. It is uh, derived from a family of uh, languages known as ML family of languages. And ML here stands for meta language, not machine learning. Uh, OCaml, in addition to being a functional first language, also allows uh, us to do imperative and object-oriented programming. So now I should first try to define what functional programming stands for. So functional programming basically is another paradigm of programming, just like uh, object-oriented programming or procedural programming, which uh, we all might have heard of. So uh, in functional programming, functions are treated as first-class citizens. So it is inspired from a mathematical system known as lambda calculus. Lambda calculus was uh, introduced by Alonzo Church in the 1930s. Uh, after which, uh, Alan Turing came up with his own mathematical model of Turing machines. And later on, Church and Turing together went on to prove that uh, the two different types of mathematical models, that is, lambda calculus and uh, Turing machines, are equivalent. So this is termed as something called the Church-Turing hypothesis. So the first actual functional programming language was LISP which was introduced in 1958 by John McCarthy, who is also the one of the inventors of artificial intelligence. So more uh, functional programming languages in use uh, currently are uh, Haskell, Standard ML, which is also derived from the ML family of languages, Scala, which is uh, functional programming on the JVM, and uh, the other family of languages is Lisp. Lisp is, uh, stands for a family of languages, and uh, the commonly used ones are Scheme, Closure, Racket, and uh, there are many more dialects of Scheme that are in use. So as far as OCaml is concerned, uh, it, is, uh, it dates back to Lisp. So the order of its descendants is that it started with Lisp, and uh, it went on to its successor called uh, Iswim. Iswim stands for, if you see what I mean, and uh, then came ML, and uh, then Xavier Leroy and Damien Doligas at uh, a French research institute called INRIA wrote the first version of Camel Light, which went on to be uh, a predecessor of OCaml. And uh, OCaml is the uh, programming language that we are going to have a look at now. Uh, so, before we uh, go on to look at uh, the features of OCaml, let me try and uh, tell you why we should care about it. So uh, programming languages matter, and uh, they affect the way you think about programming. End of the day, what do we want to do with programming? We use programming languages as tools to solve in interesting problems. And uh, the language that you're using affects the way you solve the problem. And uh, so to quote uh, Alan Perils, who was the first winner of the Turing Award, a language that doesn't affect the way you think about programming is not worth knowing. And now I'm going to try and convince you why OCaml is a language worth knowing. So uh, another thing to observe here is functional programming predicts the future. Let me quote some examples. So garbage collection, many of us might have heard of garbage collection, which is one single feature that makes life as a programmer easy. I'm sure C programmers here might agree with it. Um, so garbage collection was made mainstream by Java in 1995. But if we look at the history of garbage collection, it was introduced way back in the 1950s in Lisp. So it uh, took somewhere around three decades for it to be mainstream for a uh, feature that we take for granted these days. And uh, higher order functions, which I will come to in a bit, 
were uh, again introduced by LISP in 1958, but uh, they have been adapted into more and more mainstream languages like Java, C Sharp, and I'm told C++ too. And uh, the other one is type inference. So type inference is uh, the compiler does the job of uh, telling you what the type of the functions you write are. And type inference was introduced in ML. And it has been adapted into more and more mainstream languages like C++ and Java. Generics were introduced in Java 5, but they were already in ML in, uh, when it was introduced in the 1990s. So um, another question that uh, we should ask ourselves is, who are we writing programs for? We are certainly writing programs that are to be executed in machines. But there's also the element of uh, reading the programs. So it is human beings, our fellow colleagues, or our peers who are going to read the programs that we write. Uh, we spend a lot of time optimizing programs for machines. But uh, what about the human side? And uh, the uh, advantage that o OCaml gives you here is that it enables you to write elegant programs. And I'll show you how. Uh, so, uh, moving on to some of the core uh, principles of OCaml. OCaml supports immutability, and it has uh, support for algebraic data types and uh, pattern matching, which uh, makes writing complex data types easy. It also has uh, support for higher order functions, which let you treat functions like how you treat functions in mathematics. It comes with a very powerful Hindley-Milner type inference system, which does the job of uh, inferring types for you, and that makes writing programs simpler than otherwise. Uh, contrary to popular belief that uh, GC languages are not conducive for writing systems programming applications, OCaml uh, is very performant and has first class support for uh, Unix programming. So it makes it a very good candidate for writing systems programming applications. And uh, I'll speak about some of them uh, later. And uh, OCaml also comes with uh, a very performant garbage collector. We'll be seeing about that too. So to define what immutability means, we are uh, used to this notion of uh, variables, where uh, variables uh, are something that we use to uh, record data, and uh, we are used to modifying the variables. But uh, in its core, uh, when you have immutable variables, variables don't vary. So once you initialize a variable with something, it stays the same until the end of the program. I know this might be a bit uh, counterintuitive to how we program with variables. But, uh, to, I'll try to demonstrate that with one example. So this example is uh, finding the length of a list. The left side uh, is, Python's, uh, is a Python implementation, and the right one is OCaml implementation. So the Python implementation is very straightforward, right? You have a variable called length. Initially, it's 0. You just uh, loop through the entire list, and you increment uh, the counter every time you loop through the list. And end of uh, it, you just print the length of the list. But uh, how do we do this in OCaml? Uh, I told you that uh, variables cannot be mutated. Meaning, uh, once it's initialized, you cannot change the value of the variable. So here, sorry. So here comes uh, recursion. Uh, I'll try to break down what the function does. So let uh, rec rec stands for a recursive function. Length uh, is the name of the function, and it takes an argument list. So we are matching list with uh, the different type constructors. So the open and close bracket indicates that it's an empty list. So when an, a list is empty, its length is essentially 0. And uh, the second type constructor is what is known as cons, where x is the head element and x is the rest of the list. So uh, x contributes for 1 uh, to the length of the list. 
and uh, we essentially call the same function again to calculate the length of the rest of the list. And uh, the final answer is uh, again the length of the list. So uh, you can see a type annotation for this below, which was actually inferred by the compiler. So uh, more often than not, it's uh, easy to gauge what a function does just by looking at the type of the function. So it's a uh, very powerful tool. Uh, next comes algebraic data types. So this uh, example that I have here is of a binary tree and uh, in order, pre-order and post-order traversal of a binary tree. Uh, for the record, I tried to have a similar comparison to that of what I had shown earlier. And uh, I couldn't fit in the Java or C++ versions of this into a slide, so I decided to skip that. Uh, so uh, algebraic data types are uh, a way to combine types, different types. So even in this example, a tree can have an empty node, or uh, it can have a node and uh, the two successes of the binary tree's node. And uh, the function here uh, is a lambda for uh, pattern matching. Lambda is, uh, like I said, uh, derived from lambda calculus. So it uh, is going to match the tree to see if it's empty or uh, if it has some data in the form of a node. And uh, you can continue the operations as that goes. Uh, coming to higher order functions, uh, like I said, uh, functions are treated as first class citizens and functions are treated like how we treat data. So in this example, as uh, we can see, we have a multiply function which basically just multiplies two integers. And uh, if you see the double function here, it's a higher order function, meaning it takes one argument in the multiply function. So when you're going to double some number, we know that it's going to be multiplied by two. So we already know one argument of that function, so that in itself is passed on to as an argument to the new function, which is double. And uh, this, uh, again, when it's applied to some number like, say, double 10, it's going to return 20. Uh, the other example here is uh, square, which is uh, you just multiply a number by itself. And the uh, quad can, again, be uh, written by using the same function square. So it also promotes reusability of the code that we have already written. Uh, so one uh, effect of this is that uh, functions are composable. You can, uh, I, I'm sure many of us might have learned about composing functions in mathematics. And you just treat the functions like how you treat them there. So compose uh, operator here, uh, sorry, it's a function here. So compose function here lets you uh, run two different functions uh, at a time. This uh, may seem like something simple, but this gives you a framework uh, which is very powerful to process data. And uh, uh, like I said, uh, OCaml comes with the uh, garbage collector, which is battle tested. Uh, it is very performant, and uh, it follows a generational collection scheme, which is it has a large major heap and a small minor heap. Uh, heap is where you allocate data of programs. The small minor heap enables us to have fast allocations. So GC is not really going to be a bottleneck for performance, and which again relates to the point about doing systems programming with OCaml. So since it comes with a performant GC, and it also has first class support for C foreign function interface, it's uh, quite straightforward to uh, write uh, bindings for C libraries with OCaml. And not only that, it allows us to leverage the ML type system, which is very powerful. So uh, this is the core of what OCaml is. 
and uh, it is justified that the people might ask do you really use ocaml somewhere so i'll try to talk a bit about that uh, so the uh, names that you see here are uh, some major industrial uses of ocaml this is not an exhaustive list by any means so uh, facebook uses ocaml for many of their internal projects uh, Jane Street Capital is a trading firm that uh, uses OCaml for almost all of their projects and they are a big source of uh, open source OCaml libraries as well. Uh, Docker uses, uh, Docker was developing a library operating system called Mirage which is completely written in OCaml. And uh, Teradis is where I work at and most of our projects are written in OCaml in various different fields. Microsoft Research uses OCaml to write this uh, programming language called F-star, which is a formal verification framework. These are some other uh, examples of software that are written in OCaml. So COC is a tool for formally verifying programs. Um, and out of COC came this project called ComCert which is a formally verified C compiler. I mean, uh, as programmers, uh, we just assume that what our compiler does is right. And that's a fair assumption to make. But end of the day, a compiler is also a piece of software. And any piece of software is written with bugs. So ComCert was one attempt to formalize a C compiler. And uh, it is very useful in mission critical software such as, say, flight system or things like that. And uh, the uh, infer is a static analyzer, again, written at Facebook. They use the static analyzers to uh, catch bugs early from their system. And uh, I'm told that it's uh, part of their code review process at Facebook. Hack is again developed at Facebook and it's, uh, it's a way to make uh, PHP have types because Facebook's early systems were written in PHP and after a point they realized that it was getting increasingly difficult to maintain that. Uh, and so they came up with this hack which uh, is a programming language that supports types in PHP. Uh, there are more such projects written in OCaml, so we do use it in real life. And now I'm going to talk about uh, the software that I work on, which is an extension of OCaml called Multicore OCaml. So OCaml has been used in lots of places, as I talked about earlier. But uh, one pain point with OCaml was that uh, OCaml did not support running programs in parallel. So uh, multicore OCaml tries to solve that problem by introducing concurrency and parallelism in OCaml. And uh, so multicore OCaml adds uh, shared memory parallelism and support for concurrency. So what do we mean by concurrency? Concurrency is the ability to run overlapped computations. And parallelism is the ability to run multiple processes at a time in different CPUs. So there's an inherent difference to it. Uh, OCaml 5 will be the first official release of OCaml that supports multicore. Uh, it is expected to be released in September, and I hope I'm not speaking too soon. So to talk a bit about uh, the history of multicore OCaml, it started in uh, way back in 2014 at the University of Cambridge. And uh, development has been happening since then in different places uh, at OCaml Labs, which was spun out of the University of Cambridge Computer Lab, and then later at IIT Madras, and now at uh, Tardis. So the major challenge with uh, multicore OCaml was that uh, the OCaml garbage collector had a global lock. So that means you cannot run it on multiple cores at a time. The major work that went into the development of multicore OCaml was the development of a garbage collector that supports multicore. And it was also important to uh, 
build something that was backwards compatible because OCaml has been in existence for more than 25 years now and there are millions of lines of code running in production and uh, we don't want to take a hit in it. Uh, so uh, multi-core OCaml introduces uh, parallelism in form of domains and concurrency in the form of effect handlers. Uh, domains are mapped one-on-one -on -one to OS threads and effect handlers uh, are uh, non-local control flow mechanism, something like exceptions to support concurrency. Uh, this is the fundamental uh, units provided by the compiler. And uh, on top of it, we built some libraries to make it more usable. So domainslib is the nested parallelism library for multi-core OCaml. It uh, provides an async await mechanism, much like uh, the promise mechanism we are all used to. Um, it also has more uh, functions that are derived from the async await mechanism, which are uh, parallel for, parallel scan, etc. Uh, so on, uh, coming to the other part of it, uh, EIO is this concurrency library. Um, it, uh, uh, OCaml actually supports concurrency even in its single core. So it has different mechanisms for supporting concurrency such as system threads. The name thread is uh, counterintuitive in the sense that those are threads, but those are still being run on single core. There's no real parallelism with the threads in OCaml. But uh, domain, which I talked about earlier, is the fundamental unit of parallelism in OCaml. Uh, the other uh, uh, commonly used mechanism for concurrency in OCaml is uh, something called LWT, lightweight threads. Uh, LWT is again a misnomer in the sense that uh, they are not really threads, they are promises. But uh, uh, they use monadic forms of concurrency for expressing overlapping computations. And that's how uh, s almost all OCaml software has been written till now. Uh, EIO is this new library for concurrency based on algebraic effects. And uh, it makes it easy to express concurrency because we need not care about uh, monads and uh, it is also more conducive to know what your program is doing because it gives support for better back traces. Uh, this small example here shows that we can run two fibers at a time. Uh, this does something very simple. It just traces a variable x and another variable y. But uh, imagine we can use this for anything that we use concurrency for, like say, reading a file or writing to a database or handling requests from a server, so on and so forth. So uh, Domainslib and uh, EIO are uh, sort of going to redefine how programs are written in OCaml. And that also brings us to an interesting point in the development of OCaml. Because all the software that has been written till now are written for single core and are optimized for the same. So my team right now is working on moving the entire ecosystem to this new framework of writing parallel and concurrent programs. And we have uh, seen many interesting things with it. Uh, like I said, uh, OCaml supports uh, CFFI and uh, uh, we have lots of software that use C bindings. And that is also something uh, relevant to this because it uh, uh, assumes that the C software is thread safe, but we found that in many cases it's not. So we are uh, also looking at uh, ways to support more tooling to do that. And this brings me to the end of uh, what OCaml and multi-core OCaml is. I'm happy to take any questions. It's a go and rust yeah. that have come up in the last decade to take off. So why do you think there's this disparity in, let's say, OCaml's adoption compared to 
more contemporary languages? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, like you said, DoCaml has been around for a longer time than something like Rust or Go, and Rust and Go have a community that's much, much bigger than OCaml's. A part of this uh, stems from the perception that uh, functional programming languages are something academic and not suitable for real life. But uh, we are actively working towards changing that perception. And uh, we have a team called the adoption team, which is working towards this. There's also this problem of uh, documentation. I think many speakers before me talked about this. But uh, OCaml uh, does have documentation, but it lacks, uh, in a sense, resources for beginners to get started with OCaml. We are uh, also working on that. and. Uh, I'm hoping we see more and more adoption as we go. I hope that answers your question. I'll be happy to take more questions offline. Thank you.